Hey, internets. Have you ever noticed that if you try to search for a good, like really good, solid explanation for just what exactly it means to be woke, most of the explanations out there make absolutely zero sense and are completely terrible. I mean, it's no wonder so many people are confused by the word woke or what it means to have wokeness. So in this video, I'm going to remedy that problem, provide a clear, objective definition for wokeness, explain why the definition I'm about to give makes the most sense, as well as explains precisely why woke ideology presents such an existential threat to truth and consequentially our liberties. And this will be a game rant playing some Batman because this is one that can just mostly be listened to. However, that doesn't make this topic any less important. So what's the best possible definition of wokeness? Well, it's an aggressive push for diversity, equity, and inclusion, usually based on the belief that outcomes which lack these things are indicative of discrimination or unfair social treatment. Now, that's a pretty short and sweet definition, but that doesn't mean it's exactly simple. There's a lot of complexity there. There's quite a lot baked into that which need to be unpacked in order to truly grasp what rokery is and understand why it is detrimental to society. And the reason that this definition of wokeness makes the most sense is because all of the problems you can generally associate with wokeness can all be traced to this. I'll first start with the idea that outcomes alone are evidence of discrimination. You've probably seen quite a few examples of this thinking. For example, articles that are along the lines of Y results disproportionately affects group X. Therefore, X group deserves special treatment and Y bad. No really, a simple experiment anyone can do is just search Brave or Google for the phrase disproportionately affects in quotations, click on the news section and you will be treated to hundreds of articles that are examples which prove my point. It's very common. Most importantly, these articles rarely go into any evidence of discrimination, rather it is just blindly assumed based on the outcome. And it's known as a reasoning error I've gone over before called outcome bias, where false assumptions are made about process based on looking at outcomes alone. And this is where we run into our first two big problems with wokeness. Sometimes the why in this equation is actually a good thing. A prime example of this being gentrification, which is economically beneficial in the long run for most people. The only reason some whine about it is because it has a short term mud disproportionate effects for certain minority groups. And again, it's only short term. In the long run, things end up neutral for them at absolute worst. The other issue here is that the implication that disparate outcomes indicate discrimination or some level of unfairness is simply not true. Disparate outcomes are caused by extremely complex social and cultural factors, assuming more discrimination as a catch-all explanation for any supposedly unfair, bad, and equal outcome is an extremely simple-minded way of looking at the world. This is a topic I covered very extensively in my video on the equity fallacy, probably the one video I've made that I find myself referencing the most because of how common this mistake is made when it comes to modern political discourse. Disparate outcomes can result from complex regional demographics or in religious or cultural differences that lead people to make significantly different different choices in life due to different beliefs they have on life, which naturally results in different outcomes in different aspects of society affecting people of hundreds of thousands of possible different ways. Asserting that these outcomes are indicative of discrimination or unfairness every time because of the disproportionate effects on various contemporary groups is an extremely short-sighted example of causal reductionism and outcome bias. It is a very, very stupid thing to believe. But a consequentialist, however, could potentially argue that that could be forgiven if diversity, equity, and inclusion were always good things, and that they were always helpful to society in all aspects. The problem here is that these three things are more or less neutral concepts. They can be good or bad depending on the context. For instance, I'll start with diversity. A meta-analysis by Velato and Bell showed some severely mixed results with the impact of demographic diversity on team performance. Sometimes it was okay, sometimes it worked out, but sometimes it either had no or even had a negative effect. But on the flip side, there's also an article by Forbes that argues that diversity is good, with the best argument they make for it being that diversity boosts creativity and innovation. Now, why is that? Well, the reason now, and what's actually kind of funny here, is of course that what both the study and the article by Forbes are actually showing is that diversity of thought is what's good. That's why it sometimes turns out to be useful, and sometimes not so much. It doesn't actually matter which contemporary group the people making up the diversity come from. What matters is fresh ideas and fresh ways to look at the world. It just so happens that ethnic diversity can sometimes come with diversity of thought, since they are more likely to come from different religious and cultural backgrounds like I mentioned earlier. Now, those of us with common sense can immediately see the problem here. The reason for why the meta-analysis showed this diversity only working some of the time, and in fact actually had some negative correlations, is because not all cultural ideas are compatible with each other. The answer, of course, to fix this is to give people freedom of association that people in business can make the best decision for themselves on what kind of diversity and what specific combination of ideas makes the most sense in the context of what they are specifically trying to do, what their company project is, what their hobby is trying to go for, etc, etc, etc. And then there's equity. 
which is one of those annoying words with, it's kind of a buzzword with dozens of different uses, such as financial assets or equality of outcome, can mean a lot of different things. But in this case, I'm just going to refer to it as the concept of giving people what they need to succeed. Now, again, this is a neutral concept. Sometimes that can make perfect sense, sometimes not. Sometimes it makes financial sense, sometimes it does not. Like, say you run a software development firm, it might make sense to make sure your business has plenty of wheelchair space for people who are physically disabled. Because physical disability doesn't mean someone would make a bad programmer. In fact, sometimes it's just the opposite. Often the physically disabled make fantastic programmers, because they have more time to focus on their mental skills. So in this case, equitable access to the business makes sense, as it is beneficial for everyone involved. I'll state it again, beneficial to everyone involved. Very key phrase there. But... What if we are talking about a mental disability for this software company? And I don't mean something innocuous like Asperger's, I mean a full-blown 60 IQ invalid, unfortunately. Well, the only way someone like that could have a job at a high-end software company is if someone else double-checked all of his code and went through all of his bugs and basically did all the work for him because they're just going to end up rewriting everything. In this case, the concept of equity obviously does not make sense. And then there is inclusion, where everyone is meant to feel welcome. This can at first seem like something that should always be good, but actually when you think about it, it is yet another neutral concept. People like to feel included, but also sometimes gatekeeping can actually be good, and a lot of people in a lot of different hobbies have been recently figuring this out, and I'll even link to a good video on it. Now, not everybody is a good fit for every project, because not everyone has the same individual taste. Some people have noticed this, especially true with hobbies again. If someone needs a hobby to be changed in order for them to feel included, well, maybe they just aren't a good fit for that hobby or the community surrounding it or the project that people are going for. To summarize, the Cult of Woke treats these neutral concepts of diversity, equity, and inclusion as always good, based on the demonstrably false assumption that a lack of these things is the result of unfairness. Anyways, with wokeness now clearly defined and explained at length, identifying what is and isn't woke becomes a lot easier to do. The first thing worthy of note that many others have noticed is that because wokeness is based on false beliefs, it has some very disturbing, striking similarities to religious cults. The most obvious of these is the censorship of heresy, because without censorship, false gods die. Woke toys are very much in favor of falsely accusing people who did not subscribe to woke beliefs of being bigoted. They accomplish this by redefining racism and bigotry to meet their ideas of wokeness, birthing concepts such as racism by outcome, or discrimination by outcome for other groups, or the idea that this kind of discrimination is any policy or system that sustains an inequity. This also has a very interesting side effect in that because wokeness looks at disparate outcomes, it is an inherently anti-colorblind way of looking at the world. Ironic, considering considering that colorblind policies are the exact opposite of racism. So when you see censorship and freedoms being taken away for the sake of diversity, equity, and inclusion, you are probably looking at some woke bullshit. This is also where one can find the biggest contradiction in woke ideology. Remember when I mentioned that the actual studies show that the key benefit of diversity is diversity of thought? Yeah, the cult of woke is very much against this kind of diversity, as anyone with a philosophy that goes against their outcome bias must be silenced, they must be attacked by the woke mob. This is why statements like, Islam is right about women, are so effective at triggering woke scolds, because it forces them to engage with this obvious contradiction in their beliefs, and they can't cope with it. This also leads to justifications for restrictions on economic freedom, and this is where things really get crazy. If you have paid attention to modern day socialists, you may have noticed that there is some very strong overlap with socialist streamers like Hassan Piker and the mindset of wokeness. This is not a coincidence, it is not a bug in the mindset of wokeness, it is a very much intentional feature. Because wokeness presumes that the disparate outcomes are unfair, it becomes the perfect ideology for socialists to use and to try and claim that you are a bigot for not adopting what they claim to be a more fair economic system by these outcomes. And thus wokeness becomes the perfect dog whistle for class warfare. This is a very effective grift because socialists generally fail in strictly economic arguments, as they have been proven inefficient and doomed to inevitable collapse into extremely authoritarian governments several times in the past. So instead, socialists have adopted wokeness as a trump card, where they use false accusations of bigotry in place of the economic arguments that they are unable to win. 
So socialist beliefs, and by extent any kind of other forms of Marxism, are also very good identifiers of wokery. So they have adopted wokeness because it lets them use moralistic fallacies in place of factual arguments. This is the main reason why anyone who considers themselves a proponent of personal freedom and liberty should stand against wokeness as well as standing against Marxism and socialism. The logical conclusion of a society that structures itself around the equity fallacy is to justify authoritarian politics under the guise of righting these made-up injustices and manufacturing victims, instead of improving society in ways that are pro-freedom, pro-individual, and economically sustainable. There are also some legal restrictions already in place, and this is something that a lot of people don't realize. For example, the disparate impact standard, which is in fact law. It allows people to legally accuse people of discrimination based purely on disparate outcomes, without needing to prove process or intent. Yes, that's right, wokeness is already law, and it has been the law for over 50 years. And it has done quite a number on our freedom of association, as any business big or small is forced to always worry about disparate impact standards, lest they get socked with all these frivolous, ridiculous lawsuits based on ridiculous accusations that don't make any sense. On the bright side, this does provide a window for how wokeness can be reasonably curbed and dealt with, but that's a video for another day. And finally, the most complex subject of all, identifying wokeness in culture and the media. While not as dangerous as the previous problems that actually do directly threaten freedom, at least not in the short term, it's easily the most annoying. Now, because wokeness desires inclusive outcomes, you can identify wokeness in works of fiction by them following what is known as the representative school of writing. This is something that has been extensively discussed at length by another YouTuber known as Literature Devil. This is a writing style that places the importance of representation over the importance of the plot in the show. This usually results in a diverse cast that is diverse and inclusive purely for the sake of being diverse and inclusive. Admittedly, if it stopped there, it honestly wouldn't be that bad. The problem is it tends to go much further. When a character exists purely to represent a minority group, often woke writers of a series will also want to ensure the character gets equitable representation. Therefore, the character is written to be always right. Any flaws th that the character has will always be portrayed through the lens of them being oppressed, so it's kind of like a pseudo-flaw, where a flaw is actually a strength that has just been twisted into something else. And anyone who questions this in the show will always be portrayed as the bad guy. Now, one very important thing to point out here, and something a huge portion of people miss, is that a minority simply existing in a story is not enough to make it woke. Rather, it's when they are being specifically represented in the story that makes it woke. In other words, there is a very big difference between a character that has been honestly written and given free will that just so happens to be a minority, and a character specifically designed to represent a minority. Representative characters are when woke writers cannot help but create Mary Sue self-insert characters for each group that they are trying to represent that serve no purpose whatsoever other than to act out the writer's political bias in a painfully predictable story. And I know this particular aspect of woke writing can be kinda complex and difficult to spot since the line between what is a representative character and what is an honest character requires a little bit of nuance, it requires a somewhat intermediate understanding of creative writing. So I will be linking Literature Devil at the end of this video for anyone who would like to get better at recognizing this particular aspect of wokeness, or if you're just curious on what he has to say. A good portion of his channel is dedicated to it, and he explains it at much greater length and detail than I ever could. But the biggest problem of all with wokeness in the media is that it panders to the lowest common intellectual denominator. Politics has always been a part of storytelling, but with wokeness, any deep philosophical insight that we used to have has now been replaced by collectivist victimhood. Any questioning of the mainstream political narrative that we used to see in stories has now been replaced by preaching of the political narrative, along with the implication that you must be a horrible, bigoted person if you disagree with the political narrative. And that's a very big problem, because since wokeness is centered on outcome bias, it can also be understood as a fundamentally consequentialist moral system. Thus, people in this cult, throughout culture, the media, and our political landscape, are always very happy to show off how something they have done has had an equitable outcome. Always proud to show off their woke beliefs in public in order to virtue signal what a good, devout little follower they are. And it's this same outcome-driven thinking that allows them to justify attacking anyone who does not subscribe to their dogma. Anyway, that's all for now. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like, subscribe, and all that, and until next time.